Orin Lyons. Presentation topic, challenges we face today as indigenous nations and challenges we face today as the human species. Sigwili. He shot out Dogus. Dogus can. I said, hello, you're the best. Isn't that true? <laughs> he shot now, you're the best. Dogus, isn't that true? Well, we're the best that's left. Here we are. You know, one way or the other. Listening to uh, Listening this morning, and I'm, I'm very sorry that I missed yesterday, because the the amount of um, scholarship and hard work that goes into those papers and and what we've had to learn over these years to to uh, maintain our uh, our integrity and also um, continue to fight, we've had to learn. A lot, and uh, uh, I've been a professor at the United uh, at uh, University of Buffalo for 37 years, and American history, pretty strong emphasis on Native history, our history. And I was listening to uh, a very good presentation this morning. Um, very well researched and and it was it was pleasant it was it was very um i don't know how to say it but i just i felt that all the work that we've been doing is bearing very strong fruit in the terms of of the people who have picked up this fight over all this period of time and um Listening to uh, Tanya's position, I remember when we first took her under our wing and said, "We're going to take you over there, and you're going to learn some stuff." And uh, and from that time to today, me being instructed by her now—that's that's really a, uh, really an accomplishment, I think, uh, on her part and on the part of all all the leaders uh, who inspire young people to do that. You know, Tanya started out just like who you are right here, sitting here, I'm talking to young people now, flat out, just learned all that. A little, a little closer. A little closer, yeah. Uh, this is, you know, good, I can hear that. This is my instruction to all the speakers, get close to, I can't hear you, you know, I, my ears are bad these years. So, the, the leadership that has um, been consistent through all of this battle has been traditional leadership. And um, the only one that I actually knew about, you know, and grew up in was at Onondaga. Onondaga is the central fire of the Haudenosaunee um, capital, so to speak, uh, where the root of the great tree of peace is. And um, it's old, very old, as all of our nations are. We're indigenous to this land. I should say at this point that <clears throat> Arthur's father, George Manuel, um, he was fighting a strong fight and he was working uh, Central South America, North America, and 1975, we had a meeting in Victoria, and at that time, we were preparing. 75, we hadn't gone to Geneva yet, and we were preparing uh, our discussion and how we were going to identify ourselves. And so we went through all of those uh, terms, you know, Aboriginal, um, Native, so forth, and we. We decided on indigenous, so that's just to let you know where that term comes from. And that was agreed upon by uh, delegates from North, Central, and South America that we would, when we travel, uh, 
to Geneva. When we address uh, the world, we will identify ourselves as the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And so that's why that terminology is used today. It's not used because uh, that's how they identify us, that we decided that's how we would identify ourselves. And of course, we didn't know a lot about the whole rest of the world. I certainly didn't. And, um, and in time, indigenous, uh, we heard from the Kurds <laughs> in Turkey saying, we're indigenous. We've been here four or 5,000 years or so. And, and we heard from the Africans saying, we're indigenous. But we weren't thinking about that at the time. We were uh, the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere, but we were accompanied in 77 by the Sami people, Norway, Sweden, Finland. And um, <clears throat> they've been strong allies. They've been strong allies over all this time. And the, the meeting in, in uh, Victoria was very important. In, consolidation of what I hear of how we have to get together in a common cause and, and unite ourselves so that we can approach the public's one people. And um, that was determined there and we finally did get to Geneva in 77. I remember uh, during the development of that particular trip, uh, Six Nation was um, central because of our long, long association with our brothers from across the water. And uh, I heard about the Gaswenta today, mentioned the two-row wampum and the use of wampum and the use of uh, our system of thinking. And the, uh, as uh, Felix Cohen, who wrote the uh, Federal Handbook of, or the Handbook on Federal Indian Law, Felix Cohen, 1941. You want to get that version because they've changed it. Don't get the other versions because they've edited it severely. Get the original version. And Felix Cohen talked about the Americanization of the people from Europe. How did you become to be who you were? It's a long, long, long story in terms of uh, our association, very short story in terms of uh, our time on this land and place. We're, we're very old people, all of us. And all of uh, the nations where they are know, you know your lands and you know uh, what it takes to survive. and. Very, very different. Everybody has uh, their own culture. They've got their own songs, and I was glad to hear about that this morning, the songs and ceremonies, which are the foundation of our identity. And uh, that's a, so fundamental to today's uh, arguments. Uh, when you should be able to answer the question, who are you? You should be able to answer that question. I remember, again, we go to the stories, as I was learning, I was pretty, well, you know, as, as kids, and I would make excuses for myself, um, my behavior wasn't altogether too good all the time. And we were a very lively group, we played a lot of lacrosse, we did a lot of fishing, we did a lot of fighting, been in a whole lot of barroom fights. Sometimes I lost, sometimes I won. But we always had them, sometimes just for the hell of it, as you know. Anyway, all through that, and then up by amazing stroke of circumstance and luck, I went to a university. After I came out of the Army, I was drafted in 1950, went into the 82nd Airborne. So I'm a jumper, I'm a trooper. Uh, I'm well trained, I'm well trained militarily, and um, probably 82nd is one of the best military trained troops in the world. Uh, Navy SEALs coming in heavy, 
military. Teach you funny things in there. Teach you, well, long story short, you know, I didn't like them, they didn't like me, we didn't get along very well. So I was out as soon as I could get out. But my brother stayed in, Lee stayed in. And Lee had to leave. You know, when I got drafted, Lee Boy had to join because we had been in so many fights in so many places, he's now by himself and I was holding his back. He said, I had to follow you in. He said, get out of town. And so he joined the 82nd and then he went on to Korea in uh, 1950. In 24, 25 years, four tours in Vietnam. Lee was, uh, we were we were close siblings, almost within a year of each other. So we kind of grew up uh, as uh, almost twins, you might say. You know, grew up together. And um, he turned out to be um, he was fluent in uh, Vietnamese. He was in intelligence. He was green beret and all kinds of medals and so forth. Tough soldier, tough soldier. And what soured him on all of that is because they, they wanted to run him through another tour in Vietnam. Now he had six months to go to finally get out of there and he had survived three tours and they went on a fourth tour. And he said, hell no, he said, I got six, six months ago, I'm not gonna go over there. They sent him over anyway. And he was sent right up to the front lines. And uh, in other words, they to try to kill him. We'll show you who's boss here. And uh, he went up there. So he's, you know, an old soldier, an old salt. Famous, as I found out later, you know, but so he's duffel bag on a bunk. And a runner come down from CQ and said, CQ wants to see you. He said, I just got here. And you know, they were, well, they were bunkered in, they were sandbagged in, they were living in the ground up there. You could hear the firefights out front. He was mad. All that service that he gave, and they were gonna put him right up front. So anyway, he goes up to the CQ steaming and uh, there's, a, there's a colonel who was a company commander up there, colonel. And he's surprised looking at the colonel, usually captains or majors, you know, colonel for company commanders. He was wondering what he did to get there. And so he said, uh, Lions, he said. He said, uh, you Indian? He said, yep. Where are you from? Upstate New York, Onondaga, Syracuse. He says, you know a guy by the name of Warren Lyons? He said, yeah, it's my brother. He said, plays the cross. Yeah, he says, not good as me, but he does play, he said. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, um, the hell are you doing up here? I'm looking at your your record. You, you got no business being here. He said, "Well, that's what I know." And he said, uh, "So you, the lions of brothers?" I said, "Yeah." Jesus. He said, "Go on, change your clothes. Get it comfortable. Come on back up." So he went down, changed his clothes, come back up, and the guy's name was uh, Riggin, Ray Riggin. Ray Riggin and I went head to head as uh, vying for a goalkeeper, All American, 1957. I was playing for Syracuse, he was playing for Army. He was a hell of a goalie. But we beat Army. We we're both undefeated that year. And uh, we beat Army. So we went undefeated, and Ray was in the other goal. And it was a hell of a game, you know. And then we went down and we played in the North-South game, as goalies for the North. So we got to be pretty friendly and I respected him because he was, he was a damn good goalie. And uh, so anyway, he says to me, 
He says, Jesus, you know what? He says, they're trying to kill you. He said, that's what I say. Well, he said, it ain't going to work here. He opened up a bottle of old granddad. He said, they were drunk for six months up there. Every night, every night, to sit there and talk about the crowd, lied to each other, you know. But it just tells you how things go around. Actually, that, that colonel saved my brother's life. And that came from a lacrosse game in 1957. So you never know. That's the point of my little story here. You just never know where things are going to take you and how important things are that you may not think so at the particular time but will turn out to be maybe a turning point in your whole life later on. Well, that was sort of my life all the way, you know. I quit school in the seventh grade. And again, they didn't like me and I didn't like them. And I used to uh, hide my shotgun or fish pole, whatever the season was, get off the bus, go back home, pick it up, and go back in the woods, you know. So my teacher was the woods. I learned everything in the woods. And I was good. I was a good hunter. And uh, had to be, you know. In the 40s, you couldn't hardly get ammunition, never mind. So you couldn't waste a shot. If you had three bullets or three shells, you better come back with three something. You just couldn't miss. And I learned a lot in the woods. And the woods are uh, probably the best teachers. In the history of the Haudenosaunee, way back when we first came together and the leaders were sitting there, I said, how are we going to instruct our people on this, this new path that we're on? And they made a, an agreement, a treaty, you might call it. It's called uh, One Dish, One Spoon. And you all know what that means, one dish, one spoon. And there was another phrase that went with it, and it said, nobody owns the woods, but everybody is responsible. And you know what that means. And so we're a traditional government at Onondaga. We're still raising chiefs the way we did a thousand years ago. There's no Bureau of Indian Affairs on our land. We don't allow any police on our land. We'll fight for it. And so we're independent. But we have a long history of that. So it doesn't just happen, it's just what you inherit. And as you will all know, and especially the youngsters here, you'll learn, you'll learn as you go along how it is. And, and you respect these elders and these people who've been holding the traditions, holding the line. Because that's who we are. And the question arises here, you know, somebody asks you, who are you? Can you answer the question? And so, going through this kind of a personal history here to give you a perspective on where, where I learned. So, pretty hot stuff, you know. One made all American, did all that, you know, in school, went to school, out of seventh grade. And I'll tell you, that wasn't easy. But I had a lot of help all the way. So after my graduation, my uncle, one of the chiefs, Irv, Irving Paulus, senior. I grew up with his son, Irving Jr., and we're the two oldest chiefs in the council today. But the old man said, hey, you want to go fishing? Boy, you know, he knew right where the bass were. He knew. I said, sure, sure. So we got in, a, got in his, uh, put, the, put the boat up on his car, and we went out in the lake. And we went out there. It's a beautiful day. And I'm thinking, he knows right where they are, you know, and sit right here. So he dropped the anchor, pretty deep lake, a lot of bass. And uh, 
So he's on that end, and I'm on this end of the boat, you know, and he's saying, oh. well, he says, you, you just uh, graduated from the university. I said, I said, yeah, and I said, oh, oh, I had no place to go. I was in a, I, I couldn't get out of the boat. I was there, and, and, and he didn't say anything more. So we're putting out our bait and putting out our lines and so forth. Well then, he said, uh, you must know a lot. I said, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot. And he says, well, you must know who you are. Yeah, okay, so good. say nothing. By this time, I'm really alert. I sent back, I said, it's gonna be a long day here. <laughs> Already. So we're going along, finally he says, well, can you tell me who you are? And I had been thinking, okay, I got to answer this, so there we go, start, you know. This is my name, this is my Indian name, this is my clan, you know, this is my mother, this father, this is their relation. Uh, every time I would say to him, I'd get quiet, he said, and that's it, huh? That's, that's it? I'd say, okay, so then I'd try again, you know, add on everything, finally. He said, need some help? I said, yeah. All right, he said. He said, look up here. And we were on a bluff. And it was like, uh, maybe 200 feet up there. And there was a young pine tree growing out of the, right out of the rocks up there. He said, see that tree? I said, yeah. And he says, that's who you are. He said, see how that root goes in there and the earth? Yeah. That's your mother. And he went on to instruct me. And I learned more in that boat in the afternoon that did four years of school at the university. But he was helping me out because I was a pretty wise ass kid and you know how you are and you do a lot of stuff. Somebody gonna knock you down, you know. And he just so I really reflected, and it was a lesson that I never, ever forgot. And that's what I'm telling you right now. That's how close you are. You're you're part of the earth. Nobody knows that. All Indians know that, but we don't say that very often. And when we talk to our Western brothers or. They don't think that way, they don't understand that. They don't understand the relationship, how close we are and who we are. And so uh, he said, if you know who you are and you understand, he said, you can go anywhere in the world and you can learn all you can learn and you'll never be carried away with another idea or another thought. You will always be who you are. So that was my anchor, and that's what I did. I went around all over the world, I've been around a lot of places, learned a lot of stuff, and uh, never once ever forgot who I am. It was a what would you say, a PhD in life that I got there? It was a simple thing. Planned the whole thing. Planned the whole thing. When I was out there in the middle of all that discussion, I said, that son of a gun, he, he, he got me out here to do this. Great man. Very honest. Very straightforward, and I can go on in all kinds of stories, you know. In Vietnam, when, when America was taking the people off the building with helicopters, Chief Paulus and his young son, now a chief, and myself, we were in the White House that very day. We were in the White House, and it was like we were down there to invite the White House up to on the dog to have a discussion. 
And we had a good relation with them. It was an amazing time for us. But when we got there in the White House, it was, it was strange, you know. It was, I didn't see anybody quiet, somber. We look at each other, we feel that. Going on, we talked to Dr. Mars, Dr. Theodore Mars that time. And um, they were there at his invitation. We were going to deliver a wampum invitation for him to come up to Onondaga. And uh, we delivered, delivered the wampum in our traditional way. And we said, now that you have that in your hand, you have to answer that. Make sure you answer it one way or the other. And the best way to answer it is to bring it back and give us your answer when you return. He appreciated that and so forth. And then he was strangely quiet, you know. He said, you men had some to eat? No, he said, you know, have lunch with me? Sure. We did. And it was quiet in here. Uh, the, the waiter, the man that was waiting on us was, was a Filipino man, you know. And, we looked at him, he looked at us, <laughs> looking at each other, both wondering what we're doing there. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Well, we recognized each other. And then, uh, and then he said, uh, what do you think about what's going on in Vietnam now? He said, we're trying to rescue those children that were half caste, they were half Vietnamese and half American. He said, they're not treating them well worse. And Chief Paulus, the old man, said, you're just using them. He said, you made a mistake to go there. You should have never been there in the first place. And now you're using them. That's not good. He said, that's not right. That was, again, Chief Paulus' statement directly. He says, well, he said, you know, I'm, and he was a very good friend of ours, really one of the few people at that time that understood, had something in his mind for us. We never had the run of the White House like we had then. <clears throat> but anyway, he said, well, he says, I'm in charge of that. He, he was, um, he was a, a medical doctor, pediatrician. And, uh, and old man ever was relentless. He said, still doesn't make it right what you're doing. He said, should never have been there in the first place. That's all he said. So it got pretty quiet. Then I, then I realized that what we were at the White House at the major time of their defeat, and that's why they were so quiet and lost the war. First war they lost in a long time. And I know that the other wars, and they, when they lost the war, or when they won all the wars that they were in, after the war, they would turn around and say, well, what else is we got to take care of? Look right at the Indians. Take care of them guys. Well, I remember those, those days. They come right after us, treaties and everything else. This time, no, it was quiet. And I, I had a sympathy for the old man. I had sympathy for him, but some that they caused themselves. So, so these relationships and these stories and so forth, they have they have uh, a relevance and they give you a they give you a, a grounding on how you make your decisions and how you understand things and how human beings are human beings. In today's times, when we are facing uh, major systemic change in the whole system of the universe as far as we're concerned. We're a, little, we're a small part of the universe, but it's changing here. And it's a systemic change. It's a change that you're not going to fix. You're not, you're not going to fix it. How are you going to fix it? Carried it to the point where you can't fix it. You might be able to modify it a little bit, you might be able to if you all get together. If we all get together, then that's the point of this discussion. This is not a discussion about Indians and white people or Indians and black people or 
any color. It's about the human species, and that was the point that I was making. This is about the human species. The human species is one family. We're one family, no matter what color you are, because we can change blood. You go to a hospital, you're going to get blood from somebody, and it won't be, could be anybody in the world, matter of fact, because we have the same blood. So what does that say? It says you're the same family. So we're a human family, and um, we're out of balance. We're way, way out of balance. So in those feisty years of, when I was a kid, 1950, 20 years old, it's kicking up dust all over the place. Um, 2.5 billion people in the world. It took a long time to get to 2.5 billion people. You go look back to human history and it's a long, long history. Now here we are, 2012, 62 years later and there's 7 billion people in the world. Does that tell you something? Folks, tell you something? Seven billion people and compounding. It's not just growing, compounding. It's nature. We're nature. Think you're going to stop that? Lots of luck. So what do you do? What do we do? Well, we have to go back to people who know. We have to get some direction here. We have to modify behavior. We have to modify human behavior. We're going to modify the behavior of the buffaloes. They've already been whacked once. They came back, or they're still there. Uh, you can't modify the behavior of salmon. No, they're going to do what they're going to do or not do according to what you do. We're closely as Chief Paula said, we're the part of the earth. And if we don't act that way and we don't understand that, then we're going to get modified. And we're pretty much on our way to being modified right now. This is like uh, the 11th inning in a 12th round championship fight. That's where we are right now. Eleventh round. It's all in question. We're going to lose. That's where we are. And it's not going to be just a loss. It's going to be consequence. It's going to be consequence to this loss. Any of the hunters? You got, I know you got hunters out here. <laughs> got good woods. Well, you used to have good woods. I look out there, coming in. I said, "What's wrong? What's going on with your woods here?" First thing I look at, first thing I look at, look at the woods, even. and uh, who's Thompson? Who the hell is Thompson? Name a whole goddamn river after him, right? Who the hell is he? Came through? Did that get you a river? Put your name on that? Get you in trouble, thinking that way. Name mountain after yourself? can't do that. That's a different way of thinking. Gets you in trouble. You have to modify smaller houses. Going back to the old ways, I'll tell you. You remember some of those old houses where they were just that big right here? Ten people living in there. Why? Hmm. Two or three sticks of wood to heat that place. You're going to live on a 12,000 square foot house or here? <laughs> You're right. You know what it costs to heat this right here? You know the kind of energy it takes? Energy you don't have? That's the fight we're in now. Seven billion people? That's what's different about today than when I was 20 years old. 2.5 billion people, well, yeah, you had a little playroom. 7 billion people, I don't think so. So where do you go? Well, you go back 
to your ceremonies. You learn how to be grateful. You learn how to give thanks again. That's what the ceremonies are, nothing but thanksgiving again and again and again. Be thankful, be thankful. Don't ask for more. You've got enough here. You've got enough of everything, right? Just share it up. That's the other part. You're going to have to learn, learn how to share. Because if you don't learn how to share, then you suffer the consequence again. So how in the world, then, the big question that I can't answer, and maybe you can help, or maybe you have, I don't know, but the question is, how do you instruct seven billion people on their relationship to the earth? How are you going to do that? But that's exactly how you're going to modify behavior. Respect. Indians have all kinds of laws, but they never wrote one down. All kinds of rules. Oh yeah, a lot of rules, a lot of laws. Sharing was one main one. Share everything. I know you guys up here are hunting in the big woods, you know. I leave part of that meat hanging in a tree for somebody. Somebody's going to need it. Share it up. That's common law. It's happening all the time. Don't take only what you need and be respectful of that. Well, I don't know, you know, with three, four people being born every second now, how are you going to instruct them? Who's the instructors? You know, your instructors, where are they? Who's listening? The reason why I brought my hat here is to make an illustration of who's leaders, you know? Who's your leader? Hey man, what's up? <laughs> what's up, man? <laughs> yeah. That's a leader. Your kids are following another leader. It's not there at Onondaga as well as anywhere else. So <clears throat> that's where we're at. Huh? <clears throat> we have good, amazing, good presentations here about the history. Now we go from there. Now what has helped the Onondaga Nation and the Haudenosaunee is we've never given up our, our instruction on raising leaders. So we can turn around and we can look straight back over a thousand years and see all those leaders. That helps us when we turn, we look ahead. We say seven generations, that was the instruction. Make your decision on behalf of seven generations coming. You, today, make your decision on their behalf. Then you yourself will have peace. It's all about sharing and responsibility. It's about being an adult being responsible. I know every one of you went through life I did and hungry. Kids are hungry all the time. Share it up even. Another story down in Rio, 1992. And uh, big gathering. Karaoke number one. All the Indians from the woods came out. Jeez, we had a great meeting. They built a, they built a big house out of straw and, you know, their own style home, cool. And we were living there and they, they came in. I mean, they were still living in the woods. They came in painted. They were wearing paint, carrying their spears, singing their song. Jeez. Made you feel good to see them talk about medicine. They were there a common cause. We sat, we sat there, we had this big meeting at Carioca, indigenous people making our position. And uh, during that time, I remember this young lady trying her best. She's just, uh, just an American girl, 
trying her best to get to karaoke because she felt this need to be there. Like it was like like a calling. People came from all over the world to get there, and uh, she couldn't get her airfare. And, and she asked for help, and we didn't have enough to get ourselves there. Never mind. We couldn't help her, but she made it. You know? Going along the streets one time, there she was. Hey, what are you doing here? Ah, oh, she says, I'm, I'm working with the kids. I said, what kids? She says, the feral kids out there, the ones who have no mother, no father, feral, living in the streets. And they had cleansed them. They had taken them out, a good many of them, uh, to have a good showcase for all the nations coming in. And I said, so how are you doing that? She says, well, I'm feeding them. And I said, well, how are you doing that? She says, well, I'm just going around to the restaurants and I waste all this food and I'm just... She says, well, come on, follow me. So, I, so that evening I followed her. And she went in the restaurant and the restaurants knew right away they had the food stacked up. She, she had, a, I obviously told them who she was and what she was doing. Give her the food and she said, come on. And we had uh, like three boxes of food that people just wouldn't eat, didn't feed. And she said, we went to a street and we stood under a street light. <clears throat> she said, just stand here. Let me see the head come around the corner. And little by little, this leader came out, who was, I would say, maybe eight years old. And he had a family. There were, I think, nine of them in his family. They were all younger than he was. He was the leader. He was eight. And he knew that she had the food. So he came across that street just like a cat, looking at me all the time. Cause that, but she had the food, so he was, didn't trust me at all. Finally got over there, and she handed him the food, and he flashed a smile that I'll never forget. Beautiful smile. Disappeared. She says, watch. In a little while down below, under the street light, here they come. They all sat in a circle, and he opened up one, and took one bite and passed it around. When that was finished, he opened up the second one and the third one. One bite at a time, each person got. I said, there's a goddamn lesson that they should be talking about over here, with all that pompous. You know what the president said at that time, Bush? Everybody was waiting. He didn't want to be there, but there he was. So his speech was, he said, the, um, the standard of living of the American people are not up for discussion here, he said. That was his message. In other words, I don't give a shit what you guys are talking about. Let's take care of ourselves. Talk about water on a party, but I understood that, and I knew that. Shocked people. Just the way we were shocked when the United States voted against the doctrine, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It didn't surprise me, because we've been fighting them for 30 years. I knew exactly who was going to. But it was good for the people to hear that around the world. They said, I thought, I thought they were very democratic. England, United States, Australia, New Zealand. It's still there. They call them, uh, what do they call them? They have a, they, you know, they, there's a short name for them. They stick together all the time. Why? Because there's a lot of indigenous people there, and there's treaties there. That's why. Canada. Canada, bad boy. Canada, bad boy today. If they open up those tar sands, forget it. Game is over. If they open up those tar sands, you're going to get so much carbon into the atmosphere, you're not going to, you know, you're just not going to handle it. And all your recycling and everything that you do mean nothing if you allow that to happen. Keystone XL pipeline, 
devil himself. You gotta fight it. You gotta fight it. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility to the future, responsibility to the seven generations. It's a good fight. We're getting help. People are starting to wake up. So you have to encourage people. And this kind of a meeting is a good meeting. I wish every one of those kids that are out here at the university was sitting here. They get an education sitting here. There's great presentations made. Thank Art. Thank your father, too, Art. I'm an old timer. Been around a long time. Still got a few shots left. But I think we're at that pitch. It's not decided yet. You know the guy that says, I'm the decider? Remember him? I'm the decider. No, no. We're the deciders. And so are we gonna do it or not? You know. Up for the fight or aren't you? You know. I'm up for the fight. A little slower. Played in the lacrosse game this spring, you know. Our medicine game. And I'll stand there with my stick. A kid about this big comes up to me. He's got his stick. Bumps me. <laughs> I look at him and say, Well, we're about even. <laughs> Well, I like that spirit. It's a good spirit. He didn't give up at all. And I know these young people ain't giving up either. So it's up to us, the leaders, stand up. Stand up and step out. Boy, this is no time to be casual. It's going to take courage. And thank you for your work. That's how it's going to go. So I'm carrying on. And uh, I don't know whether that's helpful you, for you here, but just giving you a broader perspective, what I see and where we got to go. And it's all in the offing. It's not decided yet. So it's up to us. So I encourage all of us, learn your ceremonies, get back to your ceremonies, get back to the Thanksgiving and teach your brother. Teach your brother how to pray. The old woman said to me, to Suki, people forget how strong prayer is. They forget. But we got it. Let's use it. Donate to. Thank you. Thank you.